a show about totally tempting tomatoes and a lot more coming up next. Looks like we got guests coming going, guys. You get started. Thanks. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden to Table, a show about great food and where food comes from. In today's show, we're going to focus on heritage, not only delicious heritage or heirloom tomatoes, but also heritage poultry. It's all about what's good for you, and what you want to serve in your kitchen. It's for a healthier, happier life. Now, on today's show, we'll be showcasing, as I mentioned, the tomato in a really big way. In fact, I have nearly 200 guests that will be arriving soon. I'm going to show you how to create the perfect tablescape for such a large gathering. Then once they get here, I'm putting them to the test, the taste test, that is. You see, we've prepared 10 different heirloom tomato varieties for them to try to see which ones they like best. I'm also going to introduce you to a great chef, Josh Smith. No relation but he's gonna help us put together some delicious recipes, including a gazpacho that you can make yourself in less than five minutes. Okay, now with the band up and going, it's time for me to head up to the vegetable garden to make sure everything is set for that taste test. Come on. Out here on my farm this year, we planted over 50 varieties of tomatoes, many of them heirlooms like this one called Green Zebra. You can see how it gets its name. Just look at that gorgeous sort of yellow and chartreuse color and you can't believe the flavor. High acid, very tart and very delicious. And if that's not your bag, try this one called Black Cherry or this one Mini Orange. And one of my personal favorites, Radiator Charlie's Mortgage Lifter. With so many varieties of tomatoes to choose from, we had a tomato tasting out here on my farm. We asked everyone to vote on which one they enjoyed the most. I went down one side and came back up the other side. I tasted all of them. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know there were that many varieties of tomatoes. Uh, what did you like? The rose. The rose is our favorite. The green zebra. The green zebra. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the druzba. I think the legend tomato is going to win. I've been through the tasting. Uh, this is the first time I've been through a tomato tasting, and it's very, very good. The Japanese tomatoes are very, very good, and the green tomatoes are very good. Some kind of has a zebra in the name. That green. was a particularly good one, green I thought. Zebra. Yes, the green zebra. That was good. One, two, three. Even though Green Zebra ran away with the votes, it was fun to see the reaction of so many people experiencing new types of tomatoes. In fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different heirloom varieties. One local favorite here in Arkansas is the Bradley County Pink Tomato. The state loved it so much that the legislator voted it in as the state's official fruit and vegetable. Now, farmer David Forrest has been growing these marvelous tomatoes for over 20 years. He has some tips on how he cultivates them and what makes them so popular. Bradley, ready to be picked. Well, my name's David Forrest, and we've been farming here about mm, 15 years or so, actually, here at this place. Back in the old days, it was like the Bradley as a pink tomato. They can't, that's what used to, that's what started it all. They eventually got away from it on the market because the pink tomatoes won't hold up for the shipping and the long periods of time in the trucks and things, but uh, 
The pink tomatoes is what the people around here like to eat mostly. And with so many people enjoying David's pink tomatoes, he shares a few tips to keep in mind when growing them in your garden. Well, you lay that plastic mulch and at the same time you're laying a, it's like a drip line. It's a little thin water line that is leaked. You'll turn the water on and the water will leak down right under the roots of the plants where there won't be much waste of water. It gets right there where it's needed. And the uh, plastic holds the moisture in and helps prevent grass growing right there where your plants are. When the tomato's ready, right in the bottom on the bloom end, you're going to see a little star starting to get a whitish pink color. And when it gets to that point, it no longer needs the vine. Some of them may get pinker on the vine than others, but we like to keep them pulled off before they get a lot of color in them. And you can pick it then and it'll start gradually turning, you know, after you've brought it in. We are here in uh, Warren, Arkansas with the Bradley County Pink Tomato Festival and today I'm going to demonstrate to you how to make the heavenly cake recipe. We're going to start out with uh, half a cup of butter. You can use margarine if you want to. Um, this is butter that I'm using. I'm going to add that and a half a cup of vegetable shortening in with the butter. Then we're going to add two cups of sugar. Just plain white granulated sugar to this mixture. And we're going to beat this for about two minutes. Make it nice and fluffy. Right now what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, one egg at a time into the mixture and after each egg addition, we're going to beat it a little bit more. Okay. After we have uh, beat that for about two minutes, you want to um, come over here and add a half a cup of hot water into a separate bowl. Make sure your bowl is large enough to um, hold all the ingredients. It's a half a cup of tomato juice. Take a rubber spatula and get all that out of there. All that tomato juice. And then we want to add a cup and a half of marshmallows. And then one teaspoon of vanilla extract. Stir that up just a little bit. And kind of set that aside for right now. And we're going to add to our butter and shortening and sugar mixture, we're gonna add one teaspoon of baking soda and a half a cup of uh, cocoa into this mixture and you want to sift those ingredients together real well so that they're blended really well. And then after you sift them together, stir them up real good so that the baking soda will be mixed in there well too. Okay, that just has to be kind of blended together and because you're going to add this other ingredients to it. Our tomato juice, water, and marshmallow mixture and you're going to beat it a little more we are going to take it now and we're going to pour it into our parchment paper lined pan and this pan has been sprayed with a uh, cooking spray you've got to kind of let the parchment paper stick out over the top a little bit there so that you'll have something to grab a hold of when you pour, get it out of the oven. And you got to make sure that you get all the um, edges sprayed really well with the cooking spray. The marshmallows have a tendency to congregate in one area, so you have to take your rubber spatula and kind of move them around a little bit so that they'll be distributed evenly as well. And we're going to put this in a 350 degree oven that has been preheated and bake it for 35 minutes. Okay, we're going to make the icing for the cake here. And I'm going to melt all these ingredients and let it come to a boil. And we've got a half a cup of butter. We've got four tablespoons of uh, dry cocoa. And we have uh, two tablespoons of water, fourth teaspoon of salt. We're going to melt that really well. And then we're going to add a half a cup of pecans. You want to chop those up real well. You want to keep stirring it 
make sure that you don't scorch your mixture. And the purpose of getting this really hot to a boiling temperature so that you can add it to powdered sugar in just a little bit and then it has to be added to the cake so it'll spread really well. We're gonna add our, quickly add our cocoa mixture to three and a half cups of powdered sugar. We're gonna quickly mix that together. You wanna mix this uh, icing together as quickly as possible because as it hits the powdered sugar, it begins to cool. You gotta work really fast to get it on there and get the icing to spread evenly across the cake. You know, I'm often looking for ways to enrich the flavor of a food experience. And one of the best ways for like a sandwich or a panini or even soups is to use homemade dried tomatoes. They're so delicious and they've got such depth to them in terms of their flavor. If you'd like to give it a try, you can use just about any kind of tomato, but I prefer, and it's traditional, to use a plum or paste type tomato. Uh, these are used for drying. You see, you just want to slice them in quarters or in sixths. Some recipes recommend discarding the seeds, but I don't see the need to with Romas or some of the other varieties such as San Marzano. Now you'll want to cover a baking sheet or a casserole dish with olive oil and arrange the tomatoes cut side up. Then just sprinkle them with some coarse sea salt. And if you like, you might add some garlic, whether it's dried or fresh. And the same goes with herbs such as thyme, oregano, or basil. Next, just place the tomatoes in a preheated oven at 200 degrees Fahrenheit for four to six hours. You see, time and temperature makes the difference here. Now, once they're dry, they should look like this. And you see, I've packed these away in olive oil. And before I use them on a sandwich where, where I might not want a lot of oil on the sandwich, I simply place them in a larger dish like that and the oil just drains away and then you can place them on the sandwich. They're very delicious. Give them a try. Today we're gonna do a super uh, simple gazpacho inspired recipe with tomatoes from Alan's Garden. Um, we're just gonna start by cutting the tomatoes into manageable pieces for our blender. And this recipe is using four, four tomatoes. And <clears throat> this recipe is very seasonal, you're gonna want to be making this when the tomatoes are coming on really strong. Okay, so now we'll blend in the, in the onions with a little bit of the reserved tomatoes. And one little serrano pepper with the seeds, just to give it a little bit of heat, which will mellow out with some of the sweet fig preserves. This is a perfect soup for a hot summer afternoon. Gonna add a little bit of sherry vinegar. What that's gonna do is heighten the natural acidity in the tomatoes. We'll add some of our fig preserves. And you could use sugar, honey, anything that to just bring a little bit of sweetness to it. And the last thing we're gonna finish it with is a little bit of fresh parsley from the garden. And once we get this rolling, we're gonna emulsify olive oil and we're, and we're done. Mix all this together. We'll season it with salt. And that's it. There you have it. Super simple summer gazpacho. While Josh continues to work his magic in the kitchen, I'm going to carry that tomato theme out here. They're delicious, but they're also beautiful. What I want to talk about for just a moment is the table setting that we've come up with. It's really a simple design. You see, we took these old farm tables and lined them end to end. You know, when you got 180 people coming for dinner, you want to make sure they have plenty of room. And this tent is affording us plenty of space for our guests. 
But on the tables, what I've done is tried to keep it simple and true to the locale and the season. So we did a tablecloth of what else? Burlap. And then for the plates, just simple white ironstone. And for the napkins, well, those are kitchen towels. And hey, it's all about tomatoes, isn't it? So down through the center of the table, we've put tomatoes of all different varieties piled up in plates and bowls and sitting on top of cake stands. We also have thrown in a few watermelons because, hey, watermelons love the heat and they're coming in out of the field, so they're a natural for the table. Now take a look behind me. This is the centerpiece of the table, if you will. We don't really have a central table, we have a central space, and so we filled the bottom of it with my little cart with the horse pulls, along with straw bales and gourds and more tomatoes and watermelons. And then up above, we have a swirl of, of baskets and grapevines and gourds and all sorts of things that tie into the theme. So you get the idea, keep it natural, keep it close to the earth, and keep it simple. Well, it looks like my friend Danny Williamson is up there by the poultry pen. So why don't we go up there and have a word with him before we get back to work, come on. Hey Danny, we're getting close to wrapping up the tent down there, the decorations. How do you think the birds look? They're looking really good, Alan. I'm, I'm really happy with the way they're coming along. Well, they just seem really content and, and they're just, they're growing so well. I'm very, very pleased. Yeah, uh, they're putting on nice weight and they're, they're growing. They'll be laying here for you another couple months. So, you know, a lot of people really, I think, not sure or even confused about what heritage chicken or heritage poultry means. Yeah, there's actually a definition for heritage chicken. Uh, it's long lifespan, uh, naturally reproducing, uh, and slow growth rate. So, you know, there is a definition. There's a USDA accepted def definition for heritage poultry. And those, and the, the heritage poultry breeds have to comply with the um, American Poultry Association standard of perfection. Yes, the uh, parents and grandparents must meet the APA standards of perfection. That sets up a, a certain body type, color, leg color, all the characteristics and confirmation of that particular animal. Right, the uh, American Poultry Association has a standards of perfection that spells out word for word exactly what the birds are supposed to look like, how much they're supposed to weigh and everything. That's what you want to breed for. You want to breed to make that standards of perfection. Uh, you know, it's, it's everyone's goal to reach that perfect bird. Of course, Danny, you have wonderful chickens. I've got these wonderful heritage chickens and, and poultry. We love them, but why should anybody else really care about them? Well, this is the backbone of chickens. Uh, you know, without these chickens, the commercial industry can't exist. Um, you know, this is where all the genetics come from. Uh, if these genetics are lost, we never can get them back. There's no going back. These are the original breeds. Yes, they're the original breeds that were here before the commercial industry came along. Uh, the, the new hams were actually uh, certified in 1874, so they go back that far. So here we have the New Hampshire Reds, we have the Silver Laced Wyandots, the Barred Plymouth Rock, um, and, as well as the Jersey uh, Black Giant. Mm -hmm. And all those are American birds developed in America. And then we have the, the Buff Orpington, which is a, an English breed. Yeah, the various breeds came from all across the world. Uh, the American breeds were actually developed in the United States uh, to meet the growing climates of the United States. As well as expanding population. Yes, uh, you know, there's, there was always backyard flocks uh, to, feed, to feed everyone, so. Well, I know in our family, on my mom's side, the Silver Lace Wyandotte was the bird of choice, and then on my dad's side, it was the Plymouth Rocks. They raised those, and they were, these are du they were dual purpose birds. They, they provided eggs and meat. Yes, uh, a lot of the farms actually did have the dual purpose. We actually had the Rhode Island Reds growing up on my farm. Uh, and we kept them both for meat and egg production. And that's how we got through the winter months. Now, Chef Josh Smith has chicken on the menu. I don't want to talk about it too much here, but <laughs> I probably need to head off to the kitchen and see what's going on there because it's on the menu for tonight. <laughs> All right. I'll catch you at supper. All right, thanks. thanks. Josh, I know you're like me. I mean, you love heritage poultry um, and, and heritage chickens, and the flavor that comes through them is really profound. I, I'm, and I love the way you cook them, so can you help me understand just some basics that I should know, as well as viewers should know, about how to make the most of heritage poultry? 
definitely. The, um, the main point with Heritage uh, poultry is the fact that it's um, somewhat of a leaner bird. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's very work, athletic. Yes. I mean, it's been out, it's run around, it's free range. It's working. It's working for its food. It's, yeah. it's working for, uh, you know, it's, it's working for its nourishment. And you can see, although it's lean, um, it's, it's, it's uh, muscular. Yeah. And that, yeah. and any, anytime you have a, a piece of protein that has that sort of muscle structure, it requires a different uh, type of cooking method. And, it and does. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna wanna create the flavors of browning the skin, because mm. everybody loves great crisp, crisp chicken skin. Now mm. The approach you take really is very kind of old fashioned, if I can say, because mm -hmm. these birds are really birds that, these are the birds that our grandparents and great grandparents ate. Right. Yeah. Right. And so we have to sort of think, rethink the way we 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 prepare chicken. That's right. Um, and and that's something that you don't ever. Uh, a lot of people don't ever think about is uh, these cookbooks that are from from, you know, a hundred years ago. They were using different products that, yeah. that we're not familiar with right. today. So bringing right. bringing this back and it's 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 fun and it's it's almost relearning how to cook certain things. Mm -hmm. So we'll just get this chicken going and yeah. um, and basically we're just gonna. Um, you can see that on a heritage bird that the chicken, the breast is going to be uh, a lot smaller because the bird grows slower. And, right. Um, and it's, right. It's, it's, it's <clears throat> not the industrial chicken. It's not part of the industrial farm complex. And they, you know, and, and they produce an amazing number of birds a year. But this is a very different animal. That's correct. And so what I would do with this bird is just slowly start to render the fat out of the um, out of the skin and, so just, and just roast it very slowly and then finish it in the oven. So are you putting the bird in this skillet to sort of break down the protein before you put it in the oven? Yeah, I would like to um, I would like to develop start to develop some start to, to develop some flavors in the pan. Yeah. And so later on I can take maybe some aromatics, some some peppers and some onions mm. and create this sort of quick one pot meal. Yeah. And and who doesn't love a one pot meal because there's less dishes, and, you know? <laughs> I love those. So so you just apply a little salt, mm -hmm. you got some olive oil going there, and uh, that's it at this point. That's it, and yeah. then you're just gonna finish it in the oven and any sort of uh, vegetables that you have that are in season or mm. that are looking good well, at the what market. What would you pair this with in the way of vegetables? Uh, right now, in this point of the season, we've got the we've got the great Hungarian peppers that are coming in. Yeah, They're yeah, there's sweet, a lot of summer stuff, yeah. Slightly hot, the tomatoes are finishing strong right mm. now. Yeah. Um, so you know we're we're looking at things maybe um, some some stewed vegetables to go with this mm -hmm. chicken and and once you cook it seventy percent here on the stove top you're just going to finish it slowly in the oven and you can add some some wine to add a little depth and maybe um, a little chicken stock yeah and yeah. you're talking about a great meal I mean a very flavorful meal how, how much longer does it take to to cook um, let's just take a whole bird heritage poultry. A heritage bird, heritage chicken versus the a bird we might pick up that was produced by the industrial farm complex. Uh, quite a bit longer. If if you were to just take a heritage bird and roast it, I would recommend putting it in a very simple brine. Right. And simple recipe to, to remember yeah. that is one gallon of water to one cup of salt to a half a cup of sugar. Yeah. It will get you by every time. We always make fun of, well, it tastes like chicken. But until you've tasted a real chicken, you really don't get it, do you? You don't. That's yeah. just a, it's a big understatement. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan, for having yeah. me. Appreciate it. Now, while our guests enjoy the comfortable venue we've created, Chef Josh Smith pulls the evening together with his heritage menu, served family style. Well, everyone's having a really good time, and the food is so good, I wish you could taste it. Well, you can. Try that gazpacho recipe. You'll be glad you did it. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, it's all about eating local, thinking about what you eat, and try some of those heritage varieties of tomatoes as well as poultry. Until next time, from the Garden to Table, I'm Alan Smith.